Pooja Kumar, a partner in McKinsey's Boston office. Today, I'm joined by Vivek Murthy, who served as the 19th Surgeon General of the United States. As America's doctor, Vivek created initiatives to tackle our country's most urgent public health issues, including the Ebola and Zika viruses, obesity, mental health, and the opioid crisis. Vivek is also the author of a new book, Together, The Healing Power of Human Connection in a Sometimes Lonely World. It's great to have a chance to talk to you about the public health perspective on the COVID-19 pandemic, Vivek. Thanks, Pooja. You know, you started a conversation about loneliness even before this era of physical distancing that we are all caught in right now. In your new book, you discuss the importance of communities and human connection. How has COVID changed your thinking and what concerns you most about extended periods of physical distancing and isolation and its impact on society? if at all. Hmm. No, I mean, it has, like everyone else, you know, COVID has changed my world and it's changed my perspective. Long before the pandemic hit, I was deeply concerned about loneliness, but in the age of COVID-19, uh, I'm worried that loneliness could deepen further, that we could see the physical distancing that we're being asked to observe translate into social distancing as we feel more and more disconnected from the people that we need in our lives. And the irony is that this is happening during a time of extraordinary stress, when our lives are turned upside down. And typically in moments of stress, what we do is we reach out to people. We spend time with people we love. And now we're being asked to not do that, at least in physical terms. And so I worry about what I think of as a social recession that we may incur with profound consequences for our health, for our productivity in the workplace, for how our kids do in schools. And a recession that I think will be as important, the social recession, as the economic recession that we may be faced with. Um, but I don't think that's necessarily the path we have to go down. I think that's the default path if we do nothing differently. But I also think that this could be an extraordinary opportunity for us to step back and to ask ourselves if we're leading the kind of lives that we really want to lead. This is our chance to ask ourselves where people fit in our priority list and whether there's a gap between our stated priorities and our lived priorities. I will tell you that there's a gap in my life, that if you asked me, what are your top priorities? I'd be very clear on that. My top priorities are the people I love. It's my mother, my father, my wife, my sister, my two children, my brother-in-law. It's, it's people, clearly. But then the harder question is, how am I actually living my life? Are, are the decisions I'm making about where I put my time, energy, and attention consistent with those priorities? And if I'm honest with you, I'd tell you that a lot of times it's not. So there's a gap between my stated and live priorities. And this moment is highlighting for me just how important it is to close that gap. Because I think for so many of us, we are just, we're realizing something we already knew in our hearts, which is that our relationships matter deeply to us, that they're not just nice to have, they're necessary to have. And the science behind it tells us that they affect our health and they actually affect our workplace performance. So if we use this as a moment to recognize that, to build lives that are centered around people and to make the case for creating a people-centered society, one where we do think about human connection as we design workplaces and schools, a world where we think about human connection when we're assessing the impact of policy as well, then I think we'll put ourselves on the path to creating a society that is healthier, stronger, but also more resilient than even before the pandemic began. I love the way you spoke about being intentional and actually calling ourselves to account about what we want versus how we're acting. Um, it's been it's been great to focus on what you see as individual things we could be doing. I'd love to kind of shift focus a little bit now and talk about beyond the steps that we can take by um, as or beyond the steps we can take as individuals. Uh, how can we talk about the system's response? And I'd love to start by actually talking a little bit about frontline workers. Um, of which you are one and your wife is one as well, and likely a huge proportion of your colleagues and friends. Um, paint us a picture of how things are for frontline workers. You know, how are they being supported and what types of solutions do you think we need to be thinking about to ensure that they are protected and um, treated effectively? It's a real, it's really painful to see what is happening on the front lines because we have seen now so many nurses and doctors, uh, many of whom are friends of yours and mine, uh, who are going to work each day and who don't often have enough protection that they need. 
And things are getting better on the front lines in terms of personal protective equipment, but there's still many pockets uh, of the country where people don't have what they need, including in our Veterans uh, Health Administration. And so what we need to do uh, is first and foremost, ensure that we are protecting the people on the front lines. You know, one of the things I learned in government about pandemic response is that there, while there's a lot that you have to do, there are a few core principles that you absolutely have to adhere to. One of them is to communicate transparently and truthfully, even when it's hard, especially when you mess up. The second is you have to lead with science and with scientists, putting them in front of the microphone and the camera, letting science guide your decision making, even when it's not popular. And the third is you have to get the resources to people on the front lines, the resources that they need. And in this case, that's nurses and doctors, it's grocery store workers, it's postal delivery people, it's people who are having to put themselves in the line of fire, so to speak. The tangential but related question, right, is around vulnerable populations. So I think from the definition of vulnerable has always been a tricky one. And there are so many segments of our society that, that are vulnerable in many ways and in ways that are sometimes not recognized even. You obviously issued a call to action um, in the first ever Surgeon General's report on alcohol, drugs, and health to end the public crisis of addiction. And I do wonder about this pandemic in particular and what it means for folks who are struggling with addictions I'd love for you to just talk about that a little bit, right? There, what does it mean both in this phase, but also going forward? What I worry about is what's happening right now, which is that during times of extraordinary stress and trauma, and we should think about COVID-19 actually as a major stressor, as a source of trauma across the population. What happens is that that stress and trauma can tip people over, people who were living in recovery can sometimes in the setting of severe stress and trauma can slide back and can relapse. This is, it's very common for this, for a relapse to coincide with a stressful moment in life. And gosh, this is a, a, a major one and it's happening across the population. The second reason I worry though, is because of what you said earlier, Puja, the fear that people have with engaging with the healthcare system. Look, if, if this has been a wake up call, and I think it has on many, many different levels in terms of how we think about society, in terms of how we think about structural inequities in our system, in terms of how we think about health. I think one of the areas where, where I think this is waking us up to is the fact that we've got to do such a better job of ensuring that people can get high quality care, but that they can also get it in flexible settings, right? I, and when I think about the future, I think about a society that needs fewer and fewer clinics and hospitals because we're doing two things better because we're bringing care to where people are in their homes and in their neighborhoods and also because we're doing better at prevention at changing those underlying drivers of health whether they be someone's access to food their ability to actually get out and exercise their ability to form strong social connections and if we do that well then i think people will live healthier better lives but what this epidemic has done is just pull back the curtain on the good, bad, and the ugly of what's happening in our healthcare system. It's shown us that we've got heroic staff. We've got extraordinary nurses and doctors and frontline workers, that we've got many hospital systems that are working well and that have risen to the challenge. But it's also showing us just how incredibly uneven things continue to be, how access is still difficult, how quality is still so variable, and how we have just frankly failed in medicine to use technology to its fullest extent to be able to deliver not just the care that people need, but to actually handle the data that we receive and generate the insights that we need so we can target care in the most appropriate way. This is a call for us to do that better, to do it faster, to do it more aggressively, so that not only we're prepared for the next pandemic, recognizing that even COVID-19 is gonna go on for some time, but also so that even in between pandemics, we can frankly just provide better care to people and do the job I think that they expect of their medical and public health systems. Yeah, certainly in, in my work over the last few months um, in the response phase of this, I have never seen as many Band-Aid solutions, right? Uh, manual data collection, Excel tracking as I have before. Um, and some of it is great because we're finally asking for it. 
and asking for this information to be looked at in a way that allows us to make better decisions. But I do wonder sometimes, you know, how easy will it be to slip back into what we used to have and the ways in which we used to work versus take the real lessons from this and invest to build something greater from a systems level that will allow us to be more resilient um, and more prepared. Yeah. I mean, I, you're, you're, I think your warning is so appropriate because what, what happens in general, not just around healthcare, but in every realm of life is after a crisis, people slip back to the way it was before the crisis, right? And I think what has to happen with COVID-19 is we have to make it different this time. We can't afford to go back into our old lives where we allowed people and relationships to slip to the side in terms of priority. We've got to keep people back at the center. And when it comes to healthcare, we can't afford to go back to the way it was working or not working pre-pandemic uh, because we now know just that the cost was tremendous in terms of dollars and also most importantly in terms of lives. But even so, it's going to take real leadership, both from government and the private sector to frankly keep us in an uncomfortable place so that we can keep moving. If you think about how we handle data, if you're out there tracing contacts, what do you do with the data you collect? Where do you put it? How is that data actually compiled across your local department but other departments so we can actually start to see patterns more broadly? It turns out that there is no set of best practices for how to do contact tracing in terms of what technology you should use and infrastructure you should, you should set up that's actually being used by local departments of health across this country. But I'm telling you that those departments of health sh could sure use some help from technology companies that have the ability to set up systems to handle data, to organize it, to set up firewalls to respect privacy, but they can also allow the larger data analysis that we know is so desperately needed and lacking in the larger public health system. Local departments of health had their budgets shredded in 2008 during the Great Recession. And while everything else built up, many of their budgets stayed about the same. So they have lost so much capacity, and a big part of that has been in the realm of technology. So they have not been able to often modernize. And this, and this comes to, to bear right now, when if you think about it, if you have a, a case that presents of COVID-19 in your community, and somebody has to contact trace, it's not the CDC come swooping in with a whole team of contact tracers. It's your local Department of Health. And they rely on systems and funding and people. And right now in all of those three areas, they're struggling. So even though it's not always the most exciting thing to think about building databases that work you know, for local Departments of Health, it turns out that we have a major technology gap that we have to fill at a very, very basic level. And this is our chance to, to lean into that. Uh, to do it well so that we can serve our communities now and also in the future. Well, Vivek, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a pleasure to hear your lessons learned and reflect a bit on what you've seen in this journey, but also in our broader quest to address some of the biggest issues of healthcare in our time. So I appreciate your taking the time now. No problem. It's so good to be with you, Pooja. And Pooja, thank you and all your colleagues for everything you're doing to try to help us build a better healthcare system and address the COVID-19 pandemic. Really appreciate it.